Well, uh, thank you, Comrade Chair, and it's uh, great to see uh, you know a large audience uh, of budding Stalinists who come to our faction meeting here. <laughs> of course, uh, what is Stalinism was a, a very important question facing the movement some years ago, particularly when I joined the tendency in the 1960s. I mean, the, the Soviet Union of communist parties, of the Stalinist organizations were extremely large and had a big bearing within the labor movement. And uh, there for us uh, who came into the politics, came into the ideas of Marxism, that was the, one of the main questions. What was the Soviet Union? Was it socialist? Uh, because that was the key question for on, on the left, I think. And of course, um, it was used also by the ruling class who pointed, well, socialism, there's your socialism. And they were very happy because what they pointed to in the Soviet Union was obviously the lack of democracy and the whole history of Stalinism, the purge tiles and so on and so forth. And therefore, for us, it was important to understand what it was and how it was going to develop and what was the future, if you like, for the movement. Of course, um, in relation to Stalinism, obviously it comes from the name of Stalin, ruled uh, the Soviet Union after Lenin's death up until, up until his death in 1953. But then you had the, the continuation of the regime, if you like, of the Stalinist regime, Stalinism without Stalin from 1953 onwards until the co collapse of the Soviet Union. Clearly, uh, Russia, and all the so-called socialist countries which, are, which are existed that, at that time, of China, Poland, East Germany, Hungary, and so on, clearly they were not capitalist countries insofar as that the means of production was nationalized. The laws of capitalism were, were eliminated under those circumstances, and they were able to plan the economy as opposed to the capitalist regimes in the West. I mean, the, the advantages of Stalinism, if you, uh, Stalinism was the nationalized economy, which is the only survival of the Russian Revolution of 1917. But that was an important gain, which allowed these systems, these societies, to move forward, despite the enormous bureaucracy, the totalitarianism, uh, the lack of workers' democracy, which existed within these particular countries. Uh, Trotsky wrote a book in 1936 called The Revolution Betrayed, which I recommend for you all to read because that is a full explanation of Stalinism, its roots and also the perspectives of Stalinism. And Trotsky believed that uh, it was an unstable uh, regime because it lacked uh, workers' democracy and that the bureaucracy itself, which controlled the society, would attempt to move in the direction of capitalist restoration at a certain point. Uh, obviously, it took a bit longer than what Trotsky had, had forecast. But in 1990, we see the collapse of the Soviet Union and precisely all those communist bureaucrats and officials and so on, which had dominated society, went over to capitalism. They, you know, they, they became the new ruling class as they denationalized the state industries, they privatized the state industries, and they became the new, the, rule, the new ruling capitalist class in Russia at that particular time. Now, how did this phenomena arise in the first place? That's the, the key question. I do, do, in order to understand it, we have to understand how it arose. And of course, it's all linked to the development of the Russian Revolution itself in 1917. We would say that the Russian Revolution was the greatest event in history because the working class for the first time came to power, held on to power, and created a workers' democracy. In other words, there was the rule of the Soviets, of workers' councils, of workers' uh, uh, committees, which were, found, which were spontaneously developed in the revolution. They became the basis of the new workers' state in Russia. And, uh, of course... That uh, uh, was the, if you like, democracy of the working class itself, taking charge of its own destiny. 
Oh, but of course, we understand that the Russian Revolution and the Bolshevik perspective was that you could not establish socialism or communism in one country. It was impossible, particularly in backward Tsarist Russia. Um, but it was, nevertheless, it was the first blow in the world revolution. The Russian Revolution was see, they saw themselves as the, as the first break, if you like, in the chain of world capitalism. And the task was to spread the revolution to the West. That was the only savior. Because if the revolution was successful in Germany, France, Britain, the major industrial countries, that then could supply Russia with all the technique, all the productive capacity, the skilled workers, and they then could form, a, I feel like, a united socialist states of Europe, if you like, and that basis move towards uh, socialism and communism, a new classless society. So that was the perspective of, of the Bolsheviks, was world revolution because the material basis for socialism did not exist in one country, but existed on a world scale itself. But as we know, that the Bolshevik Revolution also resulted in the uh, assault by imperialism on the worker state. Immediately, they attempted to overthrow the Bolshevik government. And as a consequence, they sent in uh, uh, armies of, of foreign intervention. It turned out in the end, 21 foreign armies invaded Russia to bring down the young worker state. They financed, they armed, they assisted the counter-revolution in Russia, the white armies, in order to try and overthrow the Bolshevik government. And therefore, from the, from the, from the word go, if you like, they were faced with this enormous problem, trying to spread the revolution, and after all, they formed the Communist International in 1919 to form communist parties in other parts of the world to prepare for the world revolution. Um, but unfortunately, because of the immaturity of the, uh, of the, of the uh, communist parties, that the revolutions which did occur in the West were betrayed by the Social Democrats. And therefore, the, the Russian Revolution was isolated in a backward country. And uh, Lenin explained, you know, if we don't have the German Revolution, we are doomed. That was the perspective. If they didn't break out of this isolation, this besieged fortress, as they called it, then inevitably the, rev the revolution would be crushed. And therefore, everything was based upon the world revolution. And uh, of course, the task of the Bolsheviks was to hold on as much as they could to institute as much as they could themselves, despite all these objective problems that they faced. And there was an enormous collapse of the productive forces. They met with a blockade, for, for instance, the, the problems of the First World War, the destruction of the First World War, the imperialist blockades, the intervention, the civil war. There was an almost collapse of industry and, 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 and technique at that time. The railroad system was put out of operation which is vital for the, for the, for the economy. And the, the, the whole of agriculture declined. The, the, the in industry declined, declined at that stage. They were holding on by their fingertips. In 1920, half the populations of Petrograd and, and Moscow went, left the cities and went back to the countryside because of famine at that time. There's even uh, uh, recordings of, of cannibalism in Russia in 1920. Such was the, the, the horrific conditions created by imperialism, which surrounded and tried to strangle the revolution. And as a consequence, all, the, all that the Bolsheviks were attempting to do under Lenin and Trotsky was to hold on and, and uh, work for the world revolution, the only savior that could get, could get them out of this problem. Unfortunately, as we know, the revolution Revolutions internationally, the German Revolution 100 years ago, today, 1923, was defeated because of a false leadership, because the Communist Party, which could have taken power because of the, the um, advice of Stalin and Zinoviev, uh, held the movement back and, and they missed the opportunity. And as a result, the revolution went down to defeat. In 1924, you had the death of Lenin. What was moral authority was incredible at that, that time. They were just holding on 
hoping there'll be a break in the situation, but that break didn't come. As a consequence, given the backwardness of Russia, and let's be clear about it, the working class in Russia numbered, what, 10 million workers? There were 150 million peasants. The industrial working class was only 3 million. So the worker state was resting on a very thin layer, if you like. And given the civil war conditions, many of those workers, many of those, those communists, volunteered to fight at the front in the Red Army, and many of them lost their lives. So you have this situation, 70% of the population could not read or write. They were illiterate. So the, under these backward conditions, the worker state was, was forced to rely upon even those who could read and write, in other words, the old officials. They tried to, to supervise them, they tried to put them under check, but that's the problem that they faced. They had to deal with the material conditions at that time. There was no other way of dealing with it, and therefore they tried to hold on. It is true they, they, they had a program against bureaucracy. And in other words, that the, the basis of the regime was the Soviets. All elections will be conducted, regular elections of all officials. All officials should have, have the right of recall. Anybody who is elected should be immediately recalled if the body elected them uh, disagreed with their position or wanted to recall them. No official should be on the, more than the average wage of a skilled worker. In other words, there shouldn't be any privileged bureaucracy. And then lastly, they said there should be an armed people. That was a very important point, an armed people to defend the revolution. These were the basic four points that Lenin had put forward, the Bolshevik party had put forward, to try and prevent bureaucracy within the Soviet Union. But it was an uphill struggle, because you could only deal with reality. And the reality was a deteriorating, deteriorating economic position, given the blockade and the imperialist aggression. And with that, you had the growth of bureaucratism. Now, bureaucracy, I mean, we all, I'm sure, had faced bureaucracy going down to the council or whatever it is in your trade union branch. But this is a, a bureaucracy on a different scale altogether of millions of officials who now began to look for their own particular interests. And this became more acute after the defeat of the imperialist in, for, uh, armies of foreign intervention. By the end of 1920, or the middle of 1920, the imperialist armies were defeated, not because of the, of the superiority of the Red Army, although they, they were heroic, but because of the support that the workers had received internationally. Like in London, for instance, where you had the strike of the dock workers on the Jolly George in 1920, who refused to uh, load the ships with mun mun munitions in order to fight uh, the, the, so the Soviet, uh, the, the Workers' Republic. But that solidarity on, on the one hand, also the mutinies that were taking place in the armies of foreign intervention, forced the imperialists to retreat. But that also meant that, uh, that there was a certain stability. And many of those who opposed the revolution, officials and so on, now began to creep back because they realized this uh, Soviet Republic was going to last. They weren't going to be overthrown. So this is where they, they began to think of their own particular futures and careers and so on. And they began to move into the apparatus, into the state and into the party apparatus. In 1920, uh, you have this, this serious situation developing. 1921, even more so, they had to ban all parties, by the way, because they'd sided with the counter-revolution. The social revolutionaries, the Mensheviks, all those sided with the imperialist uh, 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 intervention in Russia. Therefore, they were banned out of necessity, at least for a temporary period, in order to secure the workers' state, in order to secure the revolution. But the conditions were deteriorating. They had to make concessions by introducing the new economic policy. The first policy was war communism, which was simply defending the workers' state. Everything was directed towards defense. Um, but after the Civil War, and because of the discontent in the peasantry, because of requisitioning, because they had to feed the towns and the cities, that they had to revert to, they had to, they had to placate the peasantry by giving them concessions, 
market concessions, an element of capitalism, so they could sell the grain on the open market. But all these things began to um, put pressures on the worker state itself. It began, if you like, the Bolsheviks could hold the line, but the situation was becoming more and more problematic. And the bureaucracy was becoming more and more strengthened in the, uh, in, in the Republic. Why? Because the Soviets in 1917, which were the basis of the revolution, nevertheless, by 1920, they didn't meet very often because of the Civil War. They began, in other words, the grip of the working class, if you like, it was beginning to slip. And the, and the power of the bureau, bureaucracy began to assert itself more and more. The last struggle of Lenin in his life was a block with him and Trotsky against the growing bureaucratic menace within the Soviet Union. And this bureaucracy began to feel its way. Because what Lenin was thinking, good God, who's directing who here? The communists are not directing. The bureau, this bureaucratic machine, this old the state, the leftovers of, of czarism with a, fa a faint, if you like you said, a faint veneer, uh, an, an anointed with Soviet oil, the old apparatus anointed with Soviet oil. Yet all the bureaucrats were still there and they were asserting themselves and they had their own particular interests and the workers were being elbowed aside under these conditions. And the only savior was, was world revolution. There was no other way out. Of course, uh, I think you would realize that the Bolsheviks, uh, this, this, this victory of, of, of the revolution in a backward country produced these problems. You couldn't ask more than the Bolsheviks, by the way. They took power. The other, the social Democrats betrayed the revolution. The Bolsheviks took power. They looked to the West of the workers and the West also to take power. But you couldn't ask more of them. But if there was a country in the world in 1917 that you were going to pick where you could have a, a socialist revolution, probably the last one he would have picked was Russia because it was so backward. Semi-feudal conditions. Marx himself believed that the revolution was most likely to occur in the advanced industrial countries. Britain, Germany, France. Because that's where capitalism was more developed. But it didn't work out in that way. Capitalism broke at its weakest link. The chain broke at its weakest part. But that, that wasn't the problem. It wasn't the backwardness of the problem. It was the isolation of the revolution which was the problem. If the isolation was broken, then the revolution in Russia would have taken a different uh, course. But the isolation of the revolution led to its bureaucratic degeneration. As a consequence, after the death of Lenin, Stalin became more and more the mouthpiece, the figurehead of this bureaucratic reaction within the state and the party. He himself was an old Bolshevik, it is true, but he had a very narrow view of, of uh, Bolshevism, very narrow view politically, was an org I felt like a practical man, an organizer, uh, but he fitted the bill. Uh, insofar as his whole outlook was of a, a bureaucratic mentality and uh, the bureaucracy, well, as Trotsky said, the bureaucracy feel, felt him out and he felt out the bureaucracy. It was a kind of process and he began to reflect the interests of the bureaucracy, the growing bureaucracy within Russia. Socialism in one country was put forward by Stalin in 1924, in the autumn of 1924. In the spring of 1924, he was arguing what all the Bolsheviks had argued for originally, that the, the only victory of social, the only way that you could have a victory of socialism was a victory of several advanced industrial countries uh, going communist, going socialist. Um, but by night, but by the autumn of 1924, he revised this position and said, no, you will only require the efforts of one country. In other words, that's, that uh, socialism could be created within the confines of the Soviet Union, which no one had ever believed. The Bolshevik never believed, Lenin never believed, no one believed. But this idea reflected the interests of the bureaucracy at that particular time, who wanted a comfortable position, 
who wanted a quiet life to get on. They didn't want world revolution. And of course, the reaction of, of Stalin, who represented and reflected the bureaucracy, was in dire contrast to Trotsky's position, who argued for Lenin's ideas of the need for the world revolution. But of course, given the objective situation in Russia, this isolation, each defeat that took place on a world scale, resulted in a, a demoralization, if you like, within Russia itself. The workers in Russia were hanging on with their fingertips. They were desperately looking for a victory abroad, a victory in another country. And therefore, every defeat that came about just, just added to their disillusionment and demoralization. And the bureaucratic degeneration of the Russian Revolution was a result of these betrayals and isolation at that particular time. The Stalinists then, the bureaucracy got more and more confident with every defeat, they asserted themselves even more so. And of course, obviously Stalin reflected their particular interests and the first attack was against the left opposition, which they expelled along with Leon Trotsky. Then in 1930, they expelled the right opposition. In other words, Opposition was being eliminated at that time. Stalin's policies also began to change. Rather than Lenin's policy, a world revolution and socialist revolution abroad, his, his, his policies became more opportunist. Like in, uh, in 1925, 26 in Britain, they wanted to deal with the left trade union leaders. They, 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 they dropped all the criticisms of the left trade union leaders. In China, it was even more of a disaster. They looked for a block uh, between the working class, which is very small, and the progressive bourgeoisie, the they called it the block of four cl classes, which resulted in the defeat of the Chinese Revolution in 1927 and the butchery of the workers in, in, uh, in Shanghai. But these policies, if you like, they were more opportunist policies. They were looking for a shortcut, if you like, and uh, it was uh, very similar to the Menshevik ideas, as a matter of fact, before 1917. The Mensheviks had a stages theory. You know, first of all, we have to have the democratic revolution. We have to have the revolution, a capitalist revolution. Then the working class will grow and develop. And then later on, we'll have the socialist revolution. In other words, a series of stages. And that's what Stalin adopted in relation to foreign policy. However, these, there's a zigzag that occurs. In 1928-29, they go from opportunism to ultra-leftism. And we see this manifested, particularly in, in Germany, where Stalin comes forward to this brilliant idea that uh, the social democrats, that is the reformist workers, were the same as the fascists. And they, they, they invented the term social fascists. In fact, everybody was a fascist according to the Communist Party leaders, the Stalinists, except them. You had your reformist uh, uh, fa you know, fascists, you had your social fascists, your Trotsky fascists, you had radical fascists, you name it, and you fascist fascists. <laughs> so everybody's there. But that led to a calamity in Germany. Germany had the most powerful Communist Party in the world. And we know that uh, the Social Democrats and the Communists, if they'd linked together, they could have defeated Hitler, who didn't have a majority. But the problem was that uh, Stalin's policy prevented that. There would be no united front, or a united front from below, he said, which is a meaningless uh, thing. And as a result, the attack, calling the, the Social Democrats social fascists, as, as if they were worse than the fascists, resulted in the split and division of the German working class. And Hitler was able to come to power without breaking a window pane. It was a tragedy of the first magnitude. The, the victory of fascism in Germany was a result of these scandalous uh, policies being pursued by the communist international, by the Stalinists. And of course, they burnt their fingers over this. And there was a turn again a turn towards popular frontism is called. In other words, that, they should, that the communists and the workers' party should link up with the, with the bourgeois party, the liberal parties. 
There should be an alliance against fascism. You should join up with the liberals. And this again was a, a program of the, Mensch of the Mensheviks. It was a Menshevik type program. And of course, the Popular Front, which came to power in France and in Spain, also led to disaster because they tried to hold back. In other words, it, to keep an alliance with the liberals, you had to abandon your revolutionary program. And when the revolution broke out in Spain in 1936, the Stalinists held the revolution back. In fact, at that time, you could say that Stalin deliberately betrayed the Spanish revolution, which could have been successful, in order to appease the allies, the democratic allies of America, of Britain, of France. But of course, that disaster and that defeat and a series of defeats led to the Second World War itself. It was a catastrophe. In the 1930s, there was a river of blood created between the regime of, of Stalin and the regime of Lenin. In the purge trials of 1936 to 1938, all the main leaders of Stalin's Central Committee were, were put on trial. First of all, they were forced to give false confessions and they were put on trial. They were all accused. Oh, imagine it. All of the Lenin's comrades in arms accused of forming an alliance with the fascists. That they were accused of trying to bring back capitalism in the Soviet Union. And they were put on trial and shot. So if you look at a map of all the Central Committee under Lenin, you'll see, apart from those who died natural deaths, all the rest of them were killed or murdered by Stalin. There's only one, I think, Kalantoy managed to get away as a, as a diplomat in, in, in Norway. In other words, they murdered, Stalin murdered that generation and ended up with the, the murder of Leon Trotsky in 1940. So there, this gives you an indication, the obliteration of all the physical contacts with Lenin the ideas that the Stalinists came forward, of course, were dressed up in terms of Leninism. They managed to pick out phrases from Lenin in order to justify every single twist and turn that took place. And after accusing the leaders around Lenin of capitulating to fascism, in 1939, Stalin makes a deal with Hitler. The Hitler-Stalin Pact of 1939, where they divided up Poland, hoping that that would prevent an attack on the Soviet Union, which it didn't, of course. In fact, Hitler got a lot out of this by, by uh, different raw materials and oil and other exports from Russia in order to develop the, his war machine at that particular time. And of course, eventually, Hitler invades the Soviet Union in June 1941. Stalin, by the way, at this time didn't believe it. And as a result of his, of his hesitation and so on, because how could Hitler, well, when we got a deal, how could he do this? And he went into a hiding for about two weeks. And in the meantime, Hitler's armies invaded and took over large swathes of the Ukraine and other parts of the Soviet Union and, and entered into a, the biggest conflict of, of the World War, if you like, in 1943 in Leningrad and so on. But here we have uh, the, 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 uh, also the, the, the advantage of the planned economy, because although workers' democracy is destroyed in the Soviet Union, there's no Soviets, there's no workers' democracy, it's a totalitarian regime, all opposition is crushed. At the same time, they have a nationalized planned economy, bureaucratically run it is true, but it's nationalized, and as a, as a result, because of that, in the war, the Stalinist regime was able to move huge industries from one end of Russia to the other, regroup, like reorganize the economy onto a war footing, and, and build up a huge red army that was able to, to um, destroy Hitler's uh, uh, armies in 1943, 44, and 45, and, and sweep through the whole of Europe right up to Berlin at that moment. And with that, you have the creation afterwards of people's democracies. In other words, the states in, in Poland, East Germany, Hungary, and so on and so on. All these weak regimes where the capitalists supported the fascists 
The cabinets ran away. The wool machine, machinery was left in the hands in many ways, or in the Stalist and the, or with the Red Army coming through. So you had the creation then of the regimes in the image of Moscow. If you had other examples, in China, when Mao came to power in 1949, believing there was going to be 100 years, years of democracy, by the way, but given the uh, impasse of capitalism in China, he was forced to take the road of expropriating the capitalists and creating again a regime in the image of Moscow. In other words, no workers' democracy, totalitarianism from the, from the word go, but a nationalized economy. So they'd done away with landlordism, done away with capitalism, but again, no workers' control, no workers' management. And therefore, you have a bureaucratic elite on, in society, organized, if you like, of millions of officials who benefits from this, uh, the, the, the benefits from the nationalized planned economy. And they're prepared to protect it as far as they, they could do it. But of course, um, the problem with the economy is that it becomes more sophisticated. It's all very well having a economy like in the 1930s, where in Russia they relied on heavy industry, where there could be a lot of, uh, if like centralization and, and planning in, in a very uh, top-down form. But once the economy becomes more sophisticated, it requires greater participation from the, from the ordinary workers to make it work. Under capitalism, you have a market economy. The market decides on what, where things are going to be allocated. It's not done, and the, and the capitalists are guided by ma the market mechanism, where they put, the, where the greatest profit is, they'll put the investment and so on. And that works under capitalism, because at the end of the day, you know, it, it leads to disaster, but nevertheless, it does work in, in so far as developing the economy for a period of time. That's ruled out in, in the Soviet Union and these Stalinist regimes. There is no market economy. It's all about planning from the top. But if you've got bureaucrats planning from the top, what about all the mismanagement that takes place all the way along down the line? And Trotsky once said that you need the air. If you like, well, he said, he said workers, you need workers' democracy like the body needs oxygen in a planned economy. But because without the check of the workers who understand exactly what's needed on the production line, they can tell you, with, they know exactly how to organize the production. Whereas the top managers have no idea and they get, they get dictated to either manage further up the line and further up the line and further up the line. So in other words, you have the, 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 the possibility, or not the possibility, the inevitability of mismanagement of the economy itself. A lot of enormous amount of wastage, dislocation, which affected these particular regimes. Although they, they were able to move forward, and look, they, 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 you know, despite the, 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 the First World War, the Second World War, they rebuilt because of a planned economy, but bureaucratically run. But this reaches its limits in the 1970s. Instead of the growth rates being far greater than in the capitalist West, which they were, the growth rates in the Soviet Union, these other countries began to decline, 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 because the economy was being suffocated by the bureaucratic mismanagement. And as a consequence, they went into crisis in the 1980s. They failed to have any, to equal the growth rates, even of the capitalist West. And as a consequence, it gave rise to, crumb, to instability, crisis within these regimes. You did have, and I haven't got time to go into it, workers moving in the direction of trying to restore workers' democracy. In, in East Germany in 1953, in Poland, and sorry, in Hungary, 1956, or Czechoslovakia in 1968. These were, were movements towards or against the bureaucratic apparatus, but of course they were put down in uh, Germany and in Hungary. Hungary with, with the intervention of Soviet troops, again in, in Czechoslovakia, in order to maintain. They could not allow workers' democracy because that would be the end of the rule of the bureaucracy. It was incompatible with bureaucratic rule. But unfortunately, the, what the, the um, situation was 
1990, instead of a, a movement towards political revolution and the restoration of capitalism, although there were elements of that, because of a lack of a leadership, you see the, uh, uh, the, the liberals taking more of a, of a role, and you have the collapse of these regimes in Eastern Europe, in Russia, and so on, and the restoration of capitalism and all that means for these countries, which uh, in Russia, in the case of Russia, there's a collapse of 60% of the GDP. All the ills of capitalism were restored. Mafia capitalism was in introduced. So therefore we see the, the limits, if you like, of, of Stalinism. And that gave rise to a, a crisis of the Stalinist movement, the collapse of the Soviet Union, resulted in many of the parties collapsing in Britain. As I said, when I, uh, my opening remarks, when I joined this, this organization in the 1960s, the Communist Party had 35,000 members. Today, they got a rump of, I think, of about 1,000, 1,100 or something. They collapsed everywhere you look. There's been a, a, a ferment, a collapse, a loss of, loss of confidence, although they still do, in the relation to the British Communist Party this, of Britain, say that they are socialist countries. They're not. They were never. This collapse in 1990 was not a collapse of socialism, a collapse of communism. It was a collapse of Stalinism and the totalitarian bureaucratic regimes that were created at that time. What they do show, however, is a glimpse of what a society could be like, the planning that, that could happen. If only you had the dem democratic participation of the mass of the population instead of a bureaucratic elite, you could see how things could really develop. And not only in one country, because that was the whole basis of Stalinism. He was always, you know, socialism in one country. And as soon as they adopted that, you saw, as Trotsky said, a reformist and nationalist degeneration of the communist parties. It was all, you know, the British wrote the socialism, the French wrote the socialism, the, the American, whatever it would be, their own separate entities. World revolution was abandoned by them. In fact, they came forward with the idea of peaceful coexistence. We can, we can coexist with the capitalist world and so on and so forth. Not world revolution. That was abandoned long ago. And therefore, you can see the, this, uh, and, and many good workers. My, my grandfather was in the Communist Party. My mother was in the Communist Party. Genuine workers joined the Communist Party. They were, they were like, they were in these Stalinist organizations because they thought this was the real communism of Lenin. This was the, the communism of the Russian Revolution. And, uh, their hopes were squandered. Their hopes were disillusioned because of the antics of the Stalinists themselves. But Stalinism is in acute crisis. It's not as strong as it was at that time. On the contrary, it's very, very weak. And therefore, we have an opening, a possibility. We can open up relations with the Stalinists, by the way, where they have a certain base. We can, we can have a united front. We can have a dialogue with ordinary, honest workers to explain the real history of Stalinism, the real nature of Stalinism, what these regimes represented, and so on and so forth. But of course, the, the real lesson is now that whatever a revolution occurs, it cannot exist within a single country. It has to be on the basis of world revolution. Fortunately for us, the world is developing in that way. Every country is experiencing crisis to one degree or another. Everything's been prepared for a world revolution once again. And one success, one victory in one country will change the entire planet. And therefore, we have to learn the lessons of Stalinism. We have to learn and understand why it arose what the limits were, the crimes of Stalinism, to educate the new generation to understand what happened and to explain what the real ideas of communism were, what the real ideas of Leninism really are, which we will do next year, above all in the Lenin year that will take place, to arm our comrades against these, these uh, pernicious ideas, alien ideas of nationalism, of left reformism, and all the other uh, uh, variants which attempt to hold the working class back. So, comrades, we have um, a very important task to, 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 to perform. We have a task of understanding the nature of, of Stalinism, but also understanding the nature of genuine 
communism to explain that to the workers and prepare the way for the victory of the working class in the coming period. Thank <laughs> you.